All right, welcome. So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about how we can use pseudocode to describe our Turing machines. So when we're designing uh, Turing machines uh, and we're being very formal about it and drawing state diagrams, uh, we reach the uh, point where we realize, hey, the state diagram that I want to design is going to be very large and it's going to be pretty tedious to sit down and kind of draw every single transition. So it's common that except for the simplest Turing machines that we're just going to use a pseudocode to describe our machines instead of formal diagrams. And we usually do this after exploring formal di diagrams a little bit, learning a little bit how we control the tape head, move it back and forth, scan, marking symbols, and get familiar with some of these uh, just simple uh, uh, Turing machine programming tips. And once we have that feel for how to do it, we can step into pseudocode and abandon the diagrams. So let's take a look at this uh, diagram that we've actually looked at a couple times already now. This is for the language 0 to the n, 1 to the n. Um, it's simple, it has five states. Um, the way that it works, if we remember when we described it, is it's going to cross off the first symbol, uh, first zero, and then go cross off a one and go back and forth, making sure that it crosses one for one, and that's how it's gonna keep track of the two blocks being the same size. So here's what I would present as sort of a simple pseudocode description of this machine. Now, this machine up here is M1, here, when we're using pseudocode, we might do the same thing. We might say M1 is equal to, and then we'll put in some quotes here. This is some pseudocode. This is the algorithm that I want you to uh, follow. Um, and then we might expect that this could be uh, drawn by, say, someone else, an implementer, someone whose job it is to build the actual state machine from this description. We can think of this as a algorithm and that the implementer would be someone maybe writing this in some code. Or we can think of this as a high level programming language description that would have to be compiled um, by maybe a machine down into the, the state diagram. Now again, because this is pseudocode, it's sort of uh, inform and we need to take that into consideration when we are uh, writing proofs. So uh, we want to make sure that when we're writing it informally, we've write, written it with enough formalism that whoever might be reading it can understand it and understand uh, the details they might need to fill in to make it formal. Okay, so let's look at this description for this particular machine. As I mentioned already at a high level, we know that it's going to be crossing off zeros and ones. So to start out here, we're going to start out, this is sort of just a my design pattern. Um, you can follow it. Uh, I just say, okay, I restate what the input is. That's going to be because in the future, we'll see this in our next machine, that uh, it won't just be any arbitrary input string here. And what does that mean? So this allows us to do a little bit of what I'll call pre-processing um, before we get into our formal algorithm. So in this case, we're not going to do any pre-processing. We're just saying on any input W, this is what we're going to do. If the symbol, so we're, this is step one. So if the symbol scan is blank, that means there's no input and we should accept. Okay, so we'll accept. If the symbol scanned is a one, then we'll reject. You'll notice that that is a transition that did not appear up here, but is formally being mentioned in our pseudocode here saying, if there is, you know, if we're scanning a blank, that's good. That means we should accept. If we're scanning a one, we should reject. Otherwise we'll be scanning a zero and now it's time to do our algorithm. So we'll move to step two. Step two says replace the first zero with a, a blank and then repos reposition to the last non-blank symbol. So we've just covered all this move into the right business with just this sort of pseudocode saying reposition to the last non-blank symbol, knowing that that's something that we can do by just moving to the right until we see a blank and then moving once more to the left. Okay, if none exists, um, then we're gonna reject. So if there is no last symbol, we're gonna reject because we've crossed off a, one, a zero, but we had no one to cross off. If the symbol is a zero, we're going to reject. Same reason. If we've crossed off a zero and we get to the last symbol and it's not a one, we should reject. Okay. Otherwise, if it is a one, we'll replace the last one with a bucket and then rep reposition back to the first non-blank symbol. Again, that's what this loop did. Okay. So this is, again, we're just describing in pseudocode in words 
um, natural language how the machine is going to work and how the tape head is going to move back and forth. Again, if we get to the first symbol, if none exists, we should accept. If the symbol is a one, we should reject. Okay, that was that same idea from our accept up there. And we can go to state two. Okay, it's actually, now that I look at this, we might have been able to simplify this by just going to state one, which effectively does the same thing that we just did here. In any case, this is some pseudocode that describes the functioning of this state machine. And once we get, again, familiar with the state machines, we've drawn a handful of them, so we know the kind of operations that the state machine can do, we can start building things with pseudocode and start getting practice writing little pseudocodes like this. So now let's look at another uh, language, one that we did draw a state diagram for uh, as practice in one of our exercise, but let's just take a look at the pseudocode and see how these pseudocode can be a little bit easier. So to start out, we're going to notice here, I've got here on input w hash x, where w x are in 0, 1 star. This is different than what we had before. Before I just had on input w. So what is the difference here? Why have I written it this way? Well, again, I mentioned this can allow us to do a little bit of pre-processing. What that means is I'm assuming what I've got written here is something that can be decided by a uh, deterministic finite automata. That is, the pre-processing I have here is, can be expressed as a regular expression. And if I uh, have that, if I have something up here expressed as a regular expression, what I'm saying is before we even do any of the algorithm, make sure it's of the right form. For instance, in this case, it might say, make sure that there's an X, uh, sorry, a hash in there. If there's not a hash in there, then we should reject it right away. It's not the kind of string we're looking for. Also, if there's more than one hash in there, we should reject right away. That's what this is saying. So instead of having to write all that down, we can just write here a regular expression on input this regular expression, assuming that if it was anything but that regular expression, we already reject it. What we're going to do is we're going to remember the pattern that we used in our state machine to handle this, which was going back and forth between W and W and crossing off um, one symbol at a time, starting at the beginning, until we get to the end. Crossing them off in our case meant uh, turning them into X's. So this first step here is gonna say, hey, if we've already crossed them all off, if all of them have been crossed off, if W and X only contain X's, let's accept. If either X or W contains only X's and the other one has zeros and ones left in it, we should reject. So in this initial phase, it looks like we're doing a pass over everything. We're seeing, hey, is it only X's? Great. If either of them still has some uh, left over while the other one doesn't, we should reject. Okay. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to replace the first zero of W or one with an X and remember it. Now we didn't really say how to do that, but we know that the states allow us to remember things. So as long as we're not saying remember something fancy or too complicated that we haven't verified that we can remember, just remembering a symbol that we scan, we can do that by moving into a spe special state. So we're going to re replace the first zero and one with an X and remember it. Okay, we've crossed it off, we've remembered it, we're going to move to the next bit. So scan to the first zero one after the hash. Okay, we did that on this side. We're going to do it on this side now. If it matches the remembered symbol, replace it with an X. Otherwise, we just reject right at this point. Okay, so we replace it with an X. We'll reposition back to the first symbol and we're going to go to step one. So we start over again, check to see if they're all X's. If they are, we accept. Otherwise, we move on. So again, we've just described how the uh, tape head is going to move back and forth, changing symbols as we go. Um, we need to verify that, hey, are these all operations that I know I can make a little state machine for? Sometimes you might come up with a new one and you think, I'm not really sure if I can do that. Um, just sit down and do a quick little, you know, draw it out with your hand. These are often subroutines, so if you can draw the subroutine is probably only going to be a few states and it's usually only going to be a few states before you realize, oh yeah, I can do this and you can go back to writing your pseudocode. So that's just to make sure you're not writing anything in your pseudocode that, you know, a Turing machine can't do. Uh, and it's 
possible that you might run into something like that, but usually not for simple languages like this. Okay, so if you think that the Turing machine can do it, it probably can. So Turing machines are capable of computing mathematical functions for us. And we're going to look at this in a little bit more formal sense uh, a little bit later on. For instance, we could define these two languages here, L plus and L minus, that take kind of these special inputs that consist of three inputs, N, M, and then N plus M. So we should only accept if the third block is equal to the sum of the first two, or if the third block is equal to the difference of the first two in well-defined cases where n is greater than m, a negative number there wouldn't make a lot of sense to us. So can we define these languages? Sure, well certainly we can define these languages, but can we um, recognize or decide these languages with a Turing machine? The answer is actually yes, because these uh, two languages are actually context-free. Um, and I'll just hint at how we can do the first one here with the stack. We put all of n on the stack, we put all of m on top of it on the stack, and then we pop them all off to get the last block. Um, and we can do something similar in the minus case as well. Um, so these are both context-free. We could use a stack to do those, as I mentioned. Um, so I'll leave that to you if you want to draw a little PDA that does them. And, but because they're also context-free, that means that these are indeed uh, decidable or recognizable languages, so we could build the Turing machine as well. I want to look at a slightly more complicated version, one that is not context-free, L times, so multiplication. In this case, we have three blocks, N, M, and then N times M, so a multiple. Now to do this, we probably can't do this with a PDA. In fact, we can use the pumping lemma for context-free uh, languages to show that this is not a context-free language. So let's think about how we might do this as well. Okay, now here's my idea. I'm going to uh, cross off uh, one N, and when I do that, I'm going to cross off all M uh, of the blocks, uh, off both blocks. So I'll go back and forth crossing one at a time between uh, uh, these two blocks. And then once I've done that, I will go unmark all the ones in this block and then go back and cross one more off and do it again. So for every zero I cross off uh, in the first block, all n of them, I will cross off m zeros in the third block, which means I should cross off n times m symbols in the third block after doing all n loops. So let's see if I can describe this. So we'll replace well, now that I look at the pseudocode that I've written here, I've gone ahead and did it the other way around. I'm going to cross off one in the middle block and then cross off n at a time. Okay, so let's see. So we'll replace a single zero in the second block with the next. Notice I'm starting to use this language of blocks. I haven't really defined that anywhere. If I was being really formal, I might have to define what a block is. But I'm hoping that my reader kind of understands, hey, we're using these hash symbols as dividers here, right? Uh, if you understand that and I understand that, then we're talking about blocks, okay? This might also be highlighted by this regular expression I had here, and remember what I mentioned about this, okay? So we'll, we'll start by crossing off one of these in the second block with an X. If there are none left, and the last block contains no zeros, we will accept. So that means we're coming here, m is zero is basically what we're saying here. Either m is zero or we've completed a bunch of loops and we've gotten down to m is zero. If m is zero, then there should be zero zeros over here and that's what this is saying. So if there's m is zero and there are zero zeros over here, we will accept. If uh, none remain and the last block still contains zeros, then that means we've been doing our crossing off here and there are still some left over. It's too many over here, so we should reject. So we're gonna reject, okay. Now, moving between the first and last block, replace n zeros with x's in both blocks. Now, if we hadn't already built a few machines and become co comfortable with how Turing machines work, we might not be able to say comfortably that this is something we can do. But now that we've made two or three different machines that go back and forth 
replacing n zeros on both sides or whatever it might be, we can be pretty confident that we can do this. So I'm going to write this all as one step. Going back and forth between the first and the uh, last block, replace n zeros in both blocks with x's. If the last block runs out of zeros in this step, reject. So if we don't have enough, we'll reject. Once done, replace the x's in the first block back with zeros for the next loop. And then we'll go back to step one and start again. So again, we'll do this. So hopefully we'll get to a point where we've reduced this block down to only x's and we'll either accept or we will reject. Okay, let's look at another language now. A block of n and n squared. Okay, so similar to some that we maybe looked before and maybe have proven or not regular or not context free. Now we can prove that this is um, uh, decidable by giving some pseudocode for it. Okay, now how about we do this? There's one way we could do this. I could do this all at once using a strategy similar to what I just did. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, wait a second. I already did this machine over here, mx, m times, that allows me to check to see if two things are the same, or to check to see if there's a product going on here between my three blocks. Well, I've only got two blocks here, so what I need to do is process this a little bit and make another block of zero to the n in front, zero to the n hash, um, and that will now be of the right form that I can run mx. So that's what I'm saying here. So step one says place a hash before the input and then copy the first block before the hash by replacing each zero with x's and restore the x's afterwards and reposition us back to the beginning of the new input. Now we're going to have something that looks like this. With this, I can run mx that last machine I designed on this input and accept or reject it, it does. And what this allows us to start seeing is how we can build subroutines out of subroutines and sort of uh, scaffold ourselves up to more complicated and more complicated machines. And I'm just gonna do this one last time here to show that now this other, this is the language we actually have looked at before, zero to the n squared. And this language can be solved now with the last machine that we just used, m square. And the way I can do this is by building in a loop, basically. I don't know which n it is here. I'll just try all the n. I'm going to start with 0. And I'm just going to increment. So I start at 0, put a 0 before the input, a 0 hash, I should say, before the input, run it on the current uh, input, and accept if it does. So if it was 1 squared reject if uh, the first block, so the one that I put in front, gets bigger than the second block. So if I ever get too big, I know I've run out, it's not possible anymore. Um, so if it rejects and the first block is larger than the second, we'll reject. Okay. Otherwise, I'm going to add a zero to the first block and go back. So I'm going to just keep adding zeros at the beginning and running the machine we just ran to check. Okay. And I'll keep doing that until we... Uh, either find an n that it is equal to n squared or determine that we've gotten too big and it is not. So with this technique that I've just mentioned of sort of scaffolding machines on top of machines on top of machines, we can actually show that for any well-defined integer functions f of n here, that this language is going to be recognized by a Turing machine or decided in fact by a Turing machine. And this is uh, something that we might end up calling the computable functions, which indeed is a class of functions that we talk about. We might call them Turing computable in this case. And by the time we get to the end of this series here, uh, we'll have a reason to believe that anything that's computable by any kind of computer could be computed by a Turing machine as well. Um, all right, so this has been an exploration of using pseudocode to make uh, more and more complicated Turing machines. This probably hints to us that, hey, we can make some pretty sophisticated Turing machines that do some pretty complicated things. And sure enough, we're going to explore a little bit more of that in our future videos. So thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you in that next video.